Uh, yes, uh, I work in the University of Vic, Central University of Catalonia, which is about uh, 70 kilometers from here, and it's in, uh, located in a rural area, which I think is uh, a good uh, thing for a university, actually. And um, I think probably the most important thing I can tell you now is that we are developing a new chair on agroecology and food systems for social transformation, <coughs> which uh, I am very optimistic it, uh, it will be a nice uh, point of uh, meeting point for uh, people here in Catalonia, of course in the world, but uh, mainly we want to start the networking with Catalonia because we are a bit uh, like uh, bullets, like a champignon, uh, right? And we want to first uh, create this uh, critical mass uh, of people working on facility from the academia, right? So, so we are on this now, but uh, of course all of us, we have international connection and so on, but uh, first we need this critical mass here to be more strong, no? Uh, hello. <laughs> so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present you first um, context of uh, what is uh, <coughs> La Villa Campesina for those of you who don't know what, who, what it is, food sovereignty and so on, the role of science and all this, and later, and this will be a bit with the PowerPoint and so on, and later I will uh, present uh, some personal <coughs> experience from which I have taken some notes actually that I'm going to take before I forget. And uh, there I think we can share things and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, of course you can interrupt me anytime, eh? so if you want to say whatever, you can, uh, you can tell me uh, in any moment of this uh, presentation. The truth is that we, we don't have so much time, no? so one hour and a half and we, we start ten minutes late, so it's not so much time, but I think it's, uh, it's okay, no? Then the, minute, the, the first thing is, I think all people, we agree here, with the concept of science for people that was developed with, uh, by Funkowitz and uh, you know this is like minimal point of departure no? because otherwise uh, I don't know what we are doing here no? so, so this is minimal point of departure but of course when you are looking at uh, uh, that, that means that the, at least you have several, several uh, characteristics no? first you are a critical researcher no? so that would be also a minimal thing no? because uh, you're critical with uh, everything that surrounds you, even with the alternatives. You know? I mean, being a critical researcher means to be critical all the time. So, of course, critical with the uh, uh, main trends of capitalism and so on, because, of course, uh, it's uh, one of the main problems we have already now. But uh, also critical when we are working <coughs> with food sovereignty and so on. We also need to be critical with food sovereignty. We need to problematize all the time, because it's the way uh, the knowledge also advances. You know? Because otherwise we are static <coughs> and there's no dynamism in, in what we do. No? And uh, this is common not only for researchers, but I think also for people who work in social movement that they also uh, tend to prioritize uh, quite often. No? The, thic the second thing which, he, which I think is important is that uh, you are uh, politically engaged. Politically engaged, we all know also what it means. It doesn't mean that you have to be in a political party, it means that you are uh, engaged with, uh, with uh, policy issues in general. Where, where you live. It can be a different level, say, international level, local level, uh, whatever, no? but it also means that you are, uh, you know, you have this, uh, um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, the, the need, that once you are critical, you, 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 you have like a need to, 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 to politically engage because in a way, you know, what, what do you want to be critical for if then you like do, do nothing, no? So it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense. It's a kind of, uh, you know, follow-up thing, like uh, very fluid, it goes like, like this, no? And of course you also are politically engaged because uh, uh, you want to transform the society in which you live in, no? Mm -hmm. In the society where we live, it's not, uh, I mean, it has a lot of uh, mancances. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, deficits. Uh, so, uh, you, you look for social transformation. What is not so common, I, I will say that uh, most of the people that work with, uh, with the, you know, with the idea of science uh, with people have at least these three characteristics. I will say this is quite common in people that we believe in this uh, concept. What is not so common, or is not like 100% of uh, people that work with this, is the, the engagement, unfortunately, with the social movements, right? So, because probably it's the most difficult part, and I will tell you later why it's so difficult, at least in my experience with La Via Campesina, because of course, different movements have different characteristics, and the case of La Via Campesina really is a kind of a monster, you know, of, uh, you know, big machine, very difficult to move with their own, you know, 
with their own uh, dynamics and uh, engage with, a kind, with this monster in a positive way, of course, is uh, from an academic point of view, is a kind of uh, tiring as well. No? It's exciting on the one side, but it's also tiring at the other, on the other side. No? So, but yes, we can find many important people and many researchers who are, uh, you know, politi politically engaged in a way, and, but, and they're critical theories and, uh, and, uh, and um, look for social transformation, but then they are not uh, engaged with the uh, roots, uh, social movements in the, from the roots, no? The problem with this, in my opinion, is that, um, well, I will tell you later of, of, uh, of this, no? Um, so more or less, this is what, what we are going to talk about today. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is to contextualize uh, the three points for the agricultural case, no? agricultural food, which is where I work, and La Via Campesina, and, uh, and, uh, and um, food sovereignty. No? Of course, uh, why we are critical researchers? Because we analyze the context, you know, mm -hmm. the context of capitalism, we solve all the policies der derived from capitalism, and you know, privatization, free trade, uh, uh, the regulation, the minimal participation of state individualism, you know, all these characteristics of, uh, of um, neoliberal capitalism that, you know, we know it has, it has some, uh, some, uh, some impacts but that, that we don't like, no? So, and uh, all these characteristics which I have put in here are very clear how they are um, uh, landed into agriculture, no? In agriculture, I, I like it very much, the issue of agriculture, uh, because it's very, um, Visual, no. In a way, it has been the latest um, sector. I could say it would be the like the latest sector that has been incorporated, you know, in this accumulation process of capitalism. Like one of the latest sector to be incorporated in the process, and everything has been very fast. You no, know? so all the impacts, everything that we analyze uh, that has already happened in other sectors in agriculture has been very fast. No, the same, the same things, but it has been very fast in very few years. And also the alternatives and the responses from social movement has been also very fast and very strong. So I think um, agriculture and food has these characteristics which I like uh, very much. No? But basically, you know, for you, uh, you know that uh, well, from, the last, uh, from the 19th century, more or less, beginning of the 20th century, we started with this industrialization of agriculture. But the main thing, it happened already with the, born, with the birth, birth, nacimiento, birth, of um, the you know, World Trade Organization you know, in 1994, and everything after that was exponential. No? And we have all this uh, privatization of uh, all the resources, privatization of water, privatization of seeds, the privatization of land, you know, and uh, uh, that have been brought to a limit to, to have the privatization of life, of life no? like uh, you know, the patents of life, which is uh, like a social movement called with, to the patents of seeds, no? because seeds is a Mat it's a life material, no? so it's, uh, this has a lot of consequences, of course. They also in terms of free trade, you know, we all, uh, you know, if, uh, if, uh, have a lot of focus on export agriculture, no? like the main type of agriculture we have to develop in our countries to promote development and so on, you know, all this discourse. And then, um, you know, the deregulation of this uh, sector, which has been promoted by the World Trade Organization and uh, kind of... Uh, uh, um, you know, main actors in this thing, then promoting as well the minimal regulation of a state, you know, in, in something as important as agriculture, no? because agriculture, if you don't have uh, policies in agriculture, and agriculture is the main activity, is the main activity that uh, we need to feed ourselves, right? I mean, and uh, food is a right, it's a kind of, it's not, uh, it's not something uh, banal, no? It's a kind, it's, it's a food, it's a human right, so it's very important. And, Try to uh, this deregulation trends that uh, to minimize, which <laughs> I'm not going to enter on that, no? Because there is a lot of hypocrisy in this, but uh, because then industrial countries uh, they know it's important, and so they have a discourse on the side, but then they have practice in other, on the other direction. But this is another thing. And this is where all the individualism, no? That is characteristics of uh, of um, you know neoliberal uh, uh, or the capitalist of uh, general capitalism that is reflected in supermarkets, for instance, no? the, you know, the way you buy your food in supermarkets is very individual, you, know, you don't go to a market uh, of a farmer market, you don't go to, you know, to a place where you have a relationship with the person that is selling you the food and that is telling, you know, it's a kind of completely different re relationship and I think the supermarket is very 
very uh, visual to see this individualism into into the agricultural food uh, into the agricultural food uh, sector. No? In a way, what we have is that uh, food uh, is uh, transferred into a commodity. So that means food is uh, not anymore seen as a human right, but just as a commodity. No? And uh, this I'm going to, because this, uh, what I've done is to separate it by, the, uh, by food chain, no? in the input part, or the food uh, production, but just for, for you to have, um, to have an, 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 an idea. No? So in the terms of, uh, of inputs, uh, we have some uh, impacts like uh, uh, in energy, we use a lot of uh, uh, petrol. We are very, it's an agriculture which uh, is uh, dependent on petrol, fossil energy, fossil fuel energy. So in, in many different parts, no? in organic fertilizers, in machinery, pesticides, and so all in the production part, in the transformation also, in the conservation also, but also in the consumption, because normally we move uh, with the car to buy our food to go to supermarket and so on. So it's, uh, it's a kind of um, you know, petrol dependent. In terms of water, we have, we have a very intensive use of water. The water is contaminated, so the implications of uh, agriculture and food is very, is very uh, important. And actually, in terms of energy, I didn't put it here, but we know that agriculture um, uh, um, um, is one of the main uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Huh? Uh, so it's uh, sectors. So it's 40 percent of um, all 40 percent of greenhouse gas emissions is being uh, produced by agriculture, and there we can add um, another 12%, uh, <laughs> which is uh, the consequence of, uh, of uh, land changes in land use, which more, most of this is linked to deforestation. And most of, the, of this deforestation, not all of it, but most of this is uh, linked to land use changes uh, because of agriculture, that the, advance, the advance of agriculture uh, frontier. For, uh, and most of it is also linked to animal feed. Uh, I'm not going to enter on that. So implications, a lot of uh, implications in terms of, um, of uh, contamination, eh? the specific <coughs> deforestation, deforestation, uh, <coughs> pollution of air, water, and so on. In terms of, uh, of uh, as well, social values, uh, there's a lot of implication because there is a, well, knowledge only is valid, no? Scientific knowledge, you know, peasants' knowledge is not valid anymore. It's a kind of devaluation of this this type of knowledge because uh, it's not productive. You only look at agriculture from a productivity side of point, point of view. So you are only interested in you know, producing more and more, more kilograms per hectare. You are not interested in other you know, uh, uh, functions. So if we want to talk in terms of ecosystem services uh, uh, language, you know, other, other uh, services that are really <laughs> agriculture uh, production already has. No? So um, you are only focused on one, on one side of, uh, of, of the not of the coin because coin only only have two. Don't like uh, we have many 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 sites. Huh? So kind of uh, yeah. I mean just uh, this. I will I will leave this presentation for you, but this I'm going to pass so you can uh, have a look at all these. No. Um, yeah, I have it here. This is also very important. I didn't say you know natural resources <coughs> deployment. Mm -hmm. You know link it to industrial agriculture in terms of biodiversity. You know animal. Uh, in terms of, of, um, of agrobiodiversity, the amount of uh, uh, native seeds and native breeds which have disappeared due to um, industrial uh, agricultural production is really um, dramatic. No? It's a kind of, uh, I would say, one of the major problems that also we have to face in the future because it's really, really dramatic. Uh, um, just for you to have an idea, we know that only three only three uh, species, like uh, not varieties, eh? species, which are rice, um, wheat, and um, and maize, corn, they they feed uh, uh, fifty percent of the food we, we eat. Only three species. You can imagine also that from that species, uh, in the past there were a lot of varieties which have already disappeared because you know international trade they are they are uh, interested only in a few of these uh, varieties, which of course are hybrids and developed in uh, laboratories. They are not indigenous ones, but, and uh, even if we go on further, we all have all the transgenic uh, GMO problem, which we are not going to enter here either today, but uh, it will be also a way that uh, we could explain this, uh, this talk today, no? the engagement with the uh, anti-GMO uh, <coughs> movement. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, very important thing as well, the issue of inequity. Normally, uh, 
industrial agricultural production, you know, you have all this, uh, all this um, technological package, which is, you know, the, the hybrid uh, varieties of seeds, the pesticides, and the, well, the agrochemicals, and then the fertilizers, you know, you know that uh, you, you need to grow this uh, high, high uh, productivity variety, hybrid variety. <coughs> And of course, that means that you also need to have some conditions. You, know? you cannot plant this plant, this seed in the, you know, um, in the worst uh, soil. You need to have access to the best soils because uh, otherwise this uh, genetic potential of these uh, seeds will not be evidentiated, will not be you know, developed. So that means you need to go to the best soils. And uh, we, also, we now have all this <laughs> land grabbing problem, uh, which is uh, linked to the but also to other political issues. But um, there is a really huge, big problem linked to, to industrial agriculture in terms of inequities in the access to land and, uh, and um, you know, the appropriation of the best uh, lands to produce <laughs> industrial uh, food for agricultural exports. No. And many of this agricultural, food, uh, agricultural production is not to feed the people. So, uh, as I say, it's also only to feed the animals or for, for agrofoils, which also has an uh, important consequences in terms of uh, of uh, mm -hmm. industrial uh, production uh, sector, no? like uh, you know, there is uh, one, nearly 1,000 uh, million people is suffering from hunger, and, uh, and then we have you know 30% of land is dedicated to animal feed, <laughs> of agricultural land. It doesn't make sense. So and, uh, I don't know the percentage of for agrofuels, but it's also quite high. So in the end, uh, we have <coughs> not so much left for for real <coughs> agricultural production for direct consumption. Also, we, there we have to add all this, which is produced for tea, for uh, cotton, for uh, other things, which are not for people to eat uh, themselves. Okay, so we have there also an important, an important issue. As I have said before, um, all this process has already happened in a relatively short period of time, and um, and, um, and all the consequences have already happened in a relatively <laughs> short period of time, both the social consequences and both the um, uh, um, environmental consequences. And that has allowed to um, uh, generate a response from the social movements in a also relatively short period of time. No? And this is the case of La Via Campesina, uh, that uh, it's a social movement that uh, it has around 200 million uh, peasants affiliated to the, to the movement, and it's uh, an international movement of peasants organizations uh, that defend, they, 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 they uh, propose and defend the concept of food sovereignty. You know? And um, uh, La Via Campesina is divided in, uh, by, by, by regions, so it's, it has in Asia, it has in Latin America, North America, Europe, and. Uh, and different uh, regions, and uh, it works completely horizontal way, right? So, um, despite there are coordinators of each uh, region, and normally there are two representatives, uh, men and women, in each of these uh, of these regions. But um, the form of uh, the work is horizontal, so that means that the the process of decision making is uh, slow. In my opinion, it's slow, but uh, it's more. <laughs> Democratic, no? It's more in terms of an assembly. But uh, when you want to do whatever thing, sometimes it's a bit uh, slow. But something of the things I will say before, no? It's one of the characteristics <coughs> you have. Something you have to have in mind when you work, and then you need to be patient, because otherwise, uh, you know, you get uh, a bit displaced. No? <coughs> um, well, I have put here some of this uh, of, of uh, three definitions of uh, food sovereignty. The first one is um, when the proposal is uh, it was developed, no? So uh, La Via Campesina they uh, they um, define in uh, in La Habana when this uh, concept was already in a meeting in La Habana when this concept was developed, the the food sovereignty as the right of each nation to maintain and develop its own capacity to produce its basic foods, respecting cultural and productive diversity. <coughs> we have the right to produce our own food in our own territory. Mm -hmm. Food sovereignty is a precondition to genuine food security. I mean, this uh, paragraph, there is a lot of information inside there, which we are not going also to, 
to, to analyze today because it's not uh, the, the, the objective of the session. No? And we don't have so much time, so I don't think. It, but uh, what is important here, I think, is that uh, they um, proposed uh, this proposal, no? this concept, of course, as a political proposal, and they, from the very beginning, they claim that uh, full sovereignty uh, is, um, is a political proposal and it's a clash of models. So it's the, the model of peace and production as a political, uh, as a political defense of, of peace and production against the model of uh, industrial production. So they always claim the clash of model. So it's not a kind of uh, the, the two of us we have uh, space here. It means that uh, it's the one or the other. I mean, this is the way they present uh, the, the, the issue, no? And uh, when you talk to them, you understand why, no? Otherwise, it's, uh, and they, they fight for that. Otherwise, later you can uh, agree or not or whatever, but uh, it's like a, they also like to present the topic, no? It's, it's, like it's the issue of the clash of models. And um, then this uh, concept, when the, the Villa Campesina already started to generate alliances with other social movements, also, the concept has started to change, no? not, not the basic of the concept, no, 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 not the message you want to send, but minor things. In, for instance, in 2002, they started to work with the more, or to introduce more gender, gender topics and feminist uh, discourse within the proposal, which before 2002 was not so clear. <coughs> or uh, they started, uh, you see, at the, at the very beginning, because it was clearly a proposal against World Trade Organization. A World Trade Organization is, a, is, a, is an organis international organization of countries, of nations, right? They, they uh, developed it as the right of each nation because it was a political proposal against the World Trade Organization policies, right? Later, they started to introduce other, other views. So they say the right of peoples, the right of communities, so they expand, you know, this is not only nation, it's Peoples they, here is when they started also to interact with indigenous uh, indigenous communities and other social movements to introduce, you know, changes. On, in, in, I mean, and these changes are important, eh? but in the end, the basic of uh, the class of models is what it doesn't change. Okay, this is what I want to. So it's people, communities, and countries, <laughs> no, to define their own agricultural, labor, fishing, food and land policies, and so on, no, and um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's also very important here the issue of culture, I think, the, in, the, in the food sovereignty issue, and uh, the, the respect by, of uh, different knowledge. And actually, the issue of the respect of different knowledge, I like it very much because um, Peter Rosset, who is a researcher in Mexico, he was uh, working before in Food First, but now he's working in Mexico. And he has been working with a lot uh, with another concept, which I like it very much. And I think it's very, this is my own uh, thought, but uh, I think it's very a strong uh, concept, which is Dialogo de Saberes. This is the Spanish, uh, I mean, actually, technically, the concept is called Dialogo de Saberes, eh? right? Uh, even in English, <coughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's not translated, because also they translated it, I think it lose, uh, it lose the essence, no? For those who doesn't, you, of you who doesn't know English, uh, pardon, uh, Spanish, <laughs> It means um, dialogue of knowledge, right? Yes. Of knowledge, uh, knowledge, yes. knowledge, yes. knowledge, yes. knowledge. Yes. knowledge yes. Okay. Uh, no, no, it's very important. It's very important. It's just a young Andalusian, yeah, just for you to know. It's another, piece of, uh, another piece of information. And in Andalusia, in Spain, we don't pronounce, uh, pr pronounce the S. But knowledge is. Okay? <laughs> Important, eh? thank you. Christos. And, uh, and I think Dialogo de Saberes is a very potent tool because it's. Uh, it's uh, now I am uh, a way of uh, putting the, the, you know, the, but just I wanted to, to put this remark because I like it. Eh? Later I go back. But this is Dialogo de Saberes, which is uh, the way, it, you know, it's, everything is about dialogue, no? But it, there is a dialogue with, with the hierarchies and, you know, about respect and so on. And it has already allowed uh, that uh, one of the weakest point, in my point of, from my point of view, of, um, of all the food sovereignty uh, discourse in practice, not in theory, in practice, it was all the agroecological issue. Mm -hmm. So um, at, uh, at the point of putting, even for the MST, I think it's you, the one with the MST thing? Mm -hmm. well, for this, even for the MST, 
at the beginning they were uh, defending the you know agricultural industrial agriculture because it's more productive and so on I understand if I was uh, a farmer <laughs> I mean who, who is who are you to tell me no no don't produce with this that you produce more and you produce with this that you produce less no, it's a kind of okay I mean why, why are you telling me that because uh, you know I really understand this no and Dialogo de Saber has been actually actually it was not until last year that there was a meeting of La Vía Campesina um, um, from the whole uh, machine of uh, La Vía Campesina agreeing on agroecology as you know as the, the model they defend. No? So it was in the theory but now in the practice it was difficult. And this Dialogo de Saber is, uh, is a, being of a tool that has allowed to get uh, different agreements of uh, people who are so different. You can imagine that in La Vía Campesina we, we had this meeting in, la, in jail no, of food sovereignty and one of the main uh, theoretical issues was what is the campesine, the peasant class? No? Because this has to be redefined now with the, with the birth of La Vía Campesina as an international actor. Because what we all have in mind as a peasant class, it has nothing to do with uh, you know, the so many different uh, people who define themselves as peasants within La Vía Campesina, which is very heterogeneous. But you have industrial farmers there, you know, people who are uh, farmers from Europe, farmers from the uh, uh, um, United States, and then you have, you know, farmers from the Altiplano of Bolivia, you know, that uh, they, they are what you probably understand as peasants. But also the, the farmers from uh, in the United States and the farmers from uh, Europe, they claim themselves as peasants, right? So, uh, and this kind of, you know, since the birth of uh, La Via Campesina, all this dialogue of the Saber has been a key issue. Which is interesting because uh, this is um, another theoretical thing that I'm going to do because I like it very much, but uh, <laughs> we have no time, I'm sorry. But um, yes, it's a key tool, and I like it because it's a tool that it has not uh, born, born, birth, born, no, it's not born uh, from capitalism. No, the, the, this tool is born from the movement, and I think this is my, of course, my thought that uh, if we want to change. The, the, the society, we want to change the, the, the system, we need to use tools which are not born from the system. Because if we use the tools which are born from the system, then it happens what always happens, that the system <laughs> absorbs alternatives and then the alternatives pass from oppositional to progressive. And like that internet, is, for example. Uh, yeah, for instance. We shouldn't use. No, we, you can use the tools depending on what you want to use for them. But for instance, uh, we, I'm going to show you a different example for uh, agriculture and food. When you use uh, labeling, labeling of uh, certification of products, mm -hmm. no organic agriculture, for instance, no, or whatever labeling. Labeling is a is a um, tool which has been born from the capitalist system, and as a tool of uh, standardization and so. On. In the end, what happened? At the beginning, very nice, no? You know, because it, uh, it allows to expand the alternatives that you want to create, or that you have created. With the time, what you get is that this alternative has been uh, being embedded by the system, and it's not, a, it's not a real alternative anymore, right? So, um, but again, this is uh, away from today's talk. Eh? This is uh, this we can span another day, but. Um, but in my opinion, if we want to, to, to uh, really transform the system and change the system, we need to create, develop, and create uh, tools which are not born from the capitalist system. Right? And I just put examples of, uh, of um, this is very easy to say, very difficult to do, but, uh, but um, yeah. So food sovereignty has five uh, pillars, actually, uh, we, it was Michael and I that, that in terms of working with Fusionity decided to, to, to use these five pillars. And actually, I, 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 uh, we have another one, which is gender, because they have been working quite often now, quite strong now with the feminist movement, uh, Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres, the Women's uh, World uh, March, and so on. But, uh, but it's access to resources, the production system, all these pillars of agroecology, and so on. Transformation, commercialization, consumption, social organization, and agricultural policies, no? And the social organization is very, very, very important because it's the pillar that uh, it deals with all the alliances uh, issue that for La Via Campesina is a key, it's a key topic. So you cannot really uh, create this alternative to uh, capitalism if there are not alliances among uh, anti-capitalist social movements, right? 
en la vía campesina del Defend the Las Anticapitalist uh, Movement. Okay? So alliance is, uh, is very important. Okay, um, this is going to pass very fast because I don't think we have a lot of time, but, uh, but um, so this is the context of uh, agriculture and La Via Campesina and, you know, food sovereignty, where it comes from and, and what do they claim for? And, you know, and then here we are, the researchers, what, what do we do? No? And then as, as researchers, we are uh, researchers that work in uh, agriculture and food systems. Oh. And actually most of the Marxist uh, researchers of uh, rural sociology, they work within a concept which is the agri-food uh, sociology, right? Which is, uh, is the, well, it's a different, and we are all a group in the RC40 of base and you know, all the time. But it's, um, so the food sociology uh, researchers, we are embedded in all this, uh, you know, this uh, system where different actors, institutions, in agri-food system, you have uh, all the assessment part, you know, where we are, all the knowledge and so on, all the management, you know, with the policy makers and, you know, all the institutions, the legislation and so on, and of course the agricultural practices with the farmers and, uh, and then we are embedding, you know, all these things is uh, kind of, uh, you know, complex, uh, complex net uh, where we all have our different uh, roles. And scientists, uh, we can decide what we want to do with this. Uh, sometimes for, us, for, for, for other people it's not so easy to say we can. You can if you have the knowledge, no? The, the, thing, you, the first thing you have to be is this critical thinking, no? Because you are a scientist, but without critical thinking, then you cannot decide what you want to do. You are in the, in the global trend, you know, the main trend that uh, leads you like a stream, no, of a river towards the direction of the river, but you cannot jump to another uh, direction if you don't know there is another direction. This is why I said before that the first thing is to be critical thinker, right? In terms of, uh, of um, in your life, I would say. But of course, if you want uh, to do research, uh, this kind of research is like the first thing. Otherwise, you are not, you cannot. It's not that you want not. You, you want not, I have invented. You don't want, but it means that you cannot, no? because you have no, no, you can, uh, what you can do. And um, yeah, so um, and of course, when you do this uh, thinking, you also know that science is a source of power. No, this is something that we will know. And uh, it's a kind of so I say, <coughs> an ethical and moral uh, issue that you have to consider yourself. It's not. Uh, you know, like, okay, I know you, uh, you are in an in a <laughs> institution that is a university, that whether you like it or not, it has uh, power in our society. It has, uh, you know, <laughs> we, like, we live in this science uh, evidence-based society where policymakers want uh, all the, you know, they want to uh, claim that what they do is evidence-based. <laughs> Other thing is what they do. But uh, they claim that they, what they do is evidence-based, and that means that scientist <coughs> role is to provide <coughs> of rigorous and you know, you know, uh, analysis of reality to be able to you know provide these evidences to scientists who are the ones who have to do the decisions. No, this is how it works. Uh, so there, in there, once you also have this piece of no of information, there is also an ethical issue no, for you as a researcher because then you say okay you have kind you know of uh, of uh, to decide okay okay uh, what I'm going to work with no and for so um, and actually in the context of agriculture it's also very clear no it means that um, that uh, we have this industrial agriculture I have told you for before and uh, I would say like 95% uh, of uh, researchers in agri -food, uh, agriculture are full work for this type of uh, industrial agriculture. Many of them because they like or they won't. Many of them because they don't know there is another type of agriculture. And actually, um, it's what uh, the Sosa Santos called the sociology of absence of the so and the sociology of emergence. No? But it's, uh, it's like this, no? And you can decide. Once, as I said, no, you are a critical uh, researcher and you know this, uh, 
different realities uh, for which type of agriculture you want to work. <coughs> do you want to work for peace and agriculture or do you want to work for industrial agriculture? Right. This is a kind of a dichotomy here that you have to... In terms of... But also to work <coughs> for peace and agriculture or for, uh, you know, agroecology and, uh, and different type of agriculture, even when you have the knowledge, no, or you have a critical thinking and you know there is this alternative, Sometimes it's also difficult because the mainstream of the institution, of the institution that provide the money for the research and so on, are focused on the contrary to what you are doing. So it in, means in industrial agriculture. And here I just put some numbers that, for instance, in Spain, the research and development uh, uh, policy, it provides 60 times more uh, money to industrial agriculture than it does to organic agriculture, which organic agriculture doesn't mean peace and agriculture, right? So uh, just to have it clear that even for peace and agriculture would be much bigger, but there are no numbers for that, no? okay? In the United States, uh, for instance, <coughs> you only have 0.1% of, of the land in experimental farms dedicated to organic agriculture. So that means that 99.9% of the land is dedicated to industrial agriculture. I mean, so even when you are a critical researcher and you want to... <laughs> I can't see very well, but uh, they are very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, even if you are a critical researcher, no, enthusiastic, you know, with uh, peace and agriculture and so on, even uh, you have the, how do you call it, you know, the institutional barriers uh, that uh, can help you to, to develop your research, you know, which in a way is uh, the money from, from the public institutions. Right? So, um, another thing there, no? And uh, it's very sad because in, re in, in fact what we have in the issue of agriculture is that, uh, you know, 70% of the food is not produced by industrial agriculture. 70% of the food worldwide is produced by peace and agriculture. But most of the research is going to industrial agriculture, no? So we are not doing science for majorities, we are in fact doing science for minority, no? So, but this is a, this is a classic anyway, so. So, um, this is what I say no, here, that the food is made by the peasants worldwide, because sometimes the, the people that uh, we live in this part of the world, we have the perspective, of course, of our you know, European context and so on, that most of the agriculture we, we see, it's uh, industrial agriculture, but we expand the, glass, the, the, the view, most of the agriculture in the world is not industrial agriculture, right? It's peace and agriculture. And it's the food that is feeding the world. It's not industrial agriculture that is feeding the world. It's peace and agriculture that is feeding the world. Otherwise, the science is going to another different uh, direction, to industrial agriculture, of course, because it is used as a tool by the system to promote industrial agriculture worldwide. So it's a tool you know, it's, that is used by the capitalist system. So, it's, uh, it's, um, so we, we, they do the research for agri-food corporations, but not, not my people. No? This is what I was saying about before a sociology of answers and sociology of uh, emergencies, no? So, um, so here we are, no? Then you want to, 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 to do these alliances, and then you have, you, you, despite all these problems you have, no? Because there are many problems eh, when you want to be in this uh, type of uh, research, um, minority, very minority, marginal research, but then also you have uh, practical problems when you are uh, working with uh, actors, at least with actors with La Via Campesina. The difference is when you are working for food sovereignty with, other, with other different actors, like NGOs and so on, which have different structures, have different uh, um, uh, yeah, way of organizing their self and so on. Everything is more, um, probably more, uh, it's more, like more pragmatic in a way, no? like, uh, you know, very fast. But, uh, and then you are working also with some social movements, right? NGOs or other actors, which is not La Via Campesina, I'm going to talk today about the La Via Campesina case, and uh, it has a different, uh, different way to organize yourself no? when you are working with these actors. But La Via Campesina is a, is a, different, is a different thing. No? Before I go that, when you want, uh, in working, when you are no, thinking on these science with people and so on, no? you can decide yourself whether you want or you can be an activist. I mean, this is not compulsory. No, for me, it's a plus. For me, for me, this, but this is my thought. 
No, and actually, Christos and I, we have talked uh, sometimes about this topic, no? That um, to me, it's difficult to do a critical uh, assessment of the reality, to be politically engaged and uh, search social transformation, but do it uh, with a really, uh, without being an activist no? yourself. No? To me, it's uh, difficult, but I understand people, <coughs> some, sometimes people cannot. Actually, me, myself, in this moment of my life, I cannot because I have two children which are very small. And now I really, it's impossible for me to follow social movements uh, um, schedules, right? The reasons, because really I cannot. Otherwise, I have to forget about my work and that's it, no? But uh, really, it's, uh, so sometimes it's not that you cannot, you are not, okay, you don't want, but it's that you cannot, no? But it's, uh, or sometimes even the, because you, I mean, also actually to be an activist, you also have to, get, to have your chip change, you know? It's a kind of a, uh, it's like when you, in agri-food, uh, in, agri uh, uh, in the agri-food uh, issue, uh, I know, I can, I can have the knowledge of many different, of, of many of the things that already happened uh, with agriculture mm -hmm. and food, but I can still be by myself in a supermarket. No? That would be, in my, from my point of view, a contradiction but it happens already because in order to be able to buy in a consumer cooperative or different type, you also have to change your habits with the other chip you have to change. It's like, okay, okay, I know, but uh, uh, I have difficulties to engage because I have to change my habits. No, and sometimes the system is so strong that to change your habits is really difficult. <coughs> so uh, with the other thing, it's also the same. I mean, that's uh, probably also to be a hard activist, you have to change your habits. And uh, you know the machine system of you know of your world meetings and so on. It makes it difficult also to 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 out of people to be really engaged as an activist. Mm? Okay, but uh, I think this is a this is a plus. No, it doesn't it doesn't mean to be better or worse. Eh? For me, anything of this is really good. It, it's, it's it's the best. It doesn't mean that you are not an activist. It doesn't mean you are not good. Eh? This is means you are simply a different reality, and that's it. Okay, just to, to clarify because uh, this is also important. But it is a plus because being an activist gives you or provides you of trust with the movement. And at least in the issue with La Via Campesina and possibility things, trust <coughs> is key. So, and unless you are like the key figure of, you know, possibility from a theoretical perspective and so on, that then social movement called you because you are a key figure, the rest of the people like me, or you know them, and they call you because they trust you, and then you have nothing to do really with them, to work you know, uh, actively in, uh, in, uh, with the movement, because the movement is based on trust. All the alliance, in a way, to work with La Via Campesina as a researcher is another form of alliance. You know? As I said before, in the social organization part of food sovereignty, the alliance topic is a key, is a, is a pillar. No? So food sovereignty has been developed through uh, the, 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 from the beginning in 1996 to what it is now through alliance with different movements. And research is just simply another alliance. So that means they have to be based on trust because alliances are based on trust. They are not based on, you know, it depends on different alliances. You can have like utilitarian alliance, right? Okay, so, so. And then you have political and more strategic alliances, okay? I'm talking about strategic alliances. Utilitarian alliance means, uh, for instance, to engage all together to prepare, um, uh, you know, um, <coughs> como se dice? una manifestación, una, yeah, you know, to prepare a, something. This is an utilitarian alliance that you maybe uh, do some, uh, something with uh, thing, people that you probably are not politically 100% engaged, but you are uh, fighting for one specific thing in one specific moment that makes possible to have this alliance at that time. Mm -hmm. Strategic alliances are politically based on this different topic. Okay. So this is why I think, at least, at least in the issue of Flavia Campesina and the issue of, uh, of um, food sovereignty, to be an activist, this is a plus because of the trust. No? So this, is this is very, very important. And actually because uh, in the agri-food uh, uh, fight, we call it, uh, um, it's very easy as well to fall down 
fall down okay, into the discussion of strategies. No? Agroecology, you can, it has three pillars no? and, or three dimensions. And two of the dimensions are related to culture, politics and so on. And one dimension is, is related to technical uh, productivity things. But it's very easy to dismantle of this political part and just go to the strategies. No? For climate change, okay, we can use this and this and this. Local traditional knowledge, of course, it's the same. So you can just dismantle all this political side of local traditional knowledge and just keep this, the, the, the technical part, no? this, the, this, the practices and so on. But practices with us, policy, so with the politics, it, it's changed out of the picture, right? So it's, uh, it's very, very, very important because then you can get lost. You don't, if you have not uh, this activist uh, uh, perspective of where you want to go at the end with the people, then you can maybe get lost in the middle of the way, just looking at the practices, but not looking at this political change in the agri-food uh, case. Eh? It's very easy. Um, the other thing that is important when you, I think it's interesting and uh, why it is a plus to, to be an activist is because it, allo it allows you to be closer to the reality and that means to be closer to their needs and do research which is useful for them. And when you do research, it's very easy to do the research, I see, I know it's not easy, no? I have to, you, but uh, to do what you like. And uh, probably what you like, or what you like the most, personally, in food society, I like it everything. This is why I do a lot of things and nothing of, every, of, of something, no? So it's a kind of, uh, well, this woman is a bit of crazy, no? But, um, but uh, it's very easy that you get, you, you do what the, the research that you like, but then it's not useful for the movement. It's not what they need in that specific moment. So if you, have, if you are not an activist in this field, if you have not the trust built with the movement, it's very difficult to know what they need in this uh, in this moment, no? So when you have, uh, oh yeah, I need to do that, and, and I have brought here, for instance, this uh, work we did with La Via Campesina about public policies uh, for food sovereignty, no? So they had this meeting. I can leave it here so you can read it. But I have uh, I have brought uh, some uh, examples, no, of things that uh, that. Um, so you can say, okay, uh, this is what I, this is the, no, this is, I was, sorry, I, I, I'm going to explain this uh, case, no? Was this public policies, no? That they had this meeting, international meeting of La Via Campesina about public policies for uh, food sovereignty. So uh, they call us, no, me and, uh, and uh, Fernando and so, uh, we have uh, some money from the Basque uh, country government, if you can help us to give us, uh, uh, a, a picture of how is uh, the thing so that later we can discuss. Probably this was not, uh, I like it because I like all these things, but uh, probably it was not uh, what you have in mind to do the research. But it's what they need in that moment, no? So it's also a kind of balance that you have to, 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 to find there as well, no? And it's only you have it if you have uh, built this trust through activism and engagement, active engagement with them, no? <coughs> Um, I think it's important when you are a scientist, um, you can have also very different roles when you are engaged with these uh, movements. Of course, um, you, you have, and you, we, we are lucky that we are paid uh, to think. So I think this is really a, a privilege. No, it's, not, it's not something that, you know, it's a kind of, wow, no? it's like it's something that you will do for free and then even you are paid for this, it's a kind of, why not? <laughs> so, so you can help in many different things, no? So you can uh, help in developing methodologies. You can help in, the, of course, in looking at comparisons of different results, no? Integrating, looking at the interaction things that they don't have time to do, but you have time to do, mm. all right? And this provides also new reality, new ways to look at the reality, and it's the way we get results, different results, no? So as a scientist, it's very, it's very useful as well, no? It also helps, to, as a scientist, we can provide uh, things like uh, linking food sovereignty in terms of theoretical, theoretical thinking with other uh, alternatives to social uh, theories that provide uh, alternatives to, to capitalism. Like with the growth, okay, so the linkages between uh, food sovereignty and the growth are quite uh, strong, or the linkages between uh, um, uh, 
or the newest linkages that they are uh, developing now between femininity and feminist studies, most, uh, particularly between, with uh, ecofeminism. Right? So these are things that uh, we as researchers have uh, time also to, to develop and provides of a theoretical corpus, which is also important because uh, in the case of Fusovenity, it is not uh, something that uh, it was a, ther it's a theoretical, um, uh, it's not a theory that was there and they used, but it, it was something that was built from, from below, which makes it interesting, but uh, if you want also to build a policy alternative, then it has to have a theoretical corpus. It's not something that you just can build uh, with the practice, at least in our society nowadays. This is well, how I see. And the other important thing that you can do when you do all these things is that uh, you also provide information in, this, in the society we have today for international panels, no? like the IISTD, I don't know if you know, International Assessment for Agricultural Science and Technology for Development, which is an United Nations panel, or the IPCC, no? the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, that uh, what they do is to look at, you know, at, the, at the, what is in the, in the academia has been published. If there is not people from the academia working on this sociology of absence, no? of these people who are the majority, but they are not studied, that means that you know, all these international panels, they will still continue uh, you know, uh, contributing to this invisibilization. No? So it's a kind of, uh, this, we as researchers that uh, work with this, we also um, help to, 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 to put this in a different uh, you know, level. Things you have to have in mind, you have to be patient. Uh, the reasons are completely different. You can imagine, for instance, the reasons of, so of natural science are different to the reasons of social science. The reasons of social science, uh, so the reasons of, uh, of research are completely different to the reasons of the social movements, and particularly in the case of La Via Campesina. As I have said, they are an horizontal, um, uh, an horizontal movement. So they have to uh, uh, take decisions. That means uh, they have to put pass through all the regions, and so everything is very delayed. And this case, for instance, I have shown you know of this uh, of this um, public policy case. It was a kind of a nightmare. So I have, and now I'm going to contradict myself, which is also nice. <laughs> so no, that means that uh, uh, I have said that uh, you are doing the policy they need. In this specific work, this was the beginning, at the end we had to do the policy, we could, the research we could do. Because we had meetings there, and they were meeting, them, meeting with us. And in the end, they had to go back to the regions and say, okay, what, how we are going to, uh, uh, to work in order to provide information, and how we are going to organize ourselves within the regions in order to see how they are these public, public policies. It did, I mean, and then we have the, the the, the um, deadline of the meeting they had, no? It's like, okay, there's no way we are going to be able to do this by the meeting unless we do our own research in terms of uh, a, a, a review of policy. It was much more difficult to if they had already engaged uh, um, more actively without this. Uh, so we had to do a research of constitutions and policies and so and we had a 1,000-page uh, document, which of course is uh, unreadable, <laughs> mostly for social movements. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, we had to uh, finally come up with this uh, thing, which is, personally, I'm not happy with the result, because I don't think it was really what they wanted. But it was the problem of how to function with this kind of uh, you know, big machines. This is the case, as I said, of La Via Campesina because it's very big. If you are working with a smaller social movement or an NGO, everything is much more fluid. But with horizontal movement, international horizontal movements, it's very difficult, right? And this is, uh, as I said, now I contradict myself in the way that uh, in the end, this research, for instance, <coughs> we, we present it in, uh, in, the, in our congresses and so on because this is the other side of, and here, yes, it's uh, the other side of the coin that uh, when you do, this re you do research as an activist, there is another problem. First, I have said, you have to be passionate. The other, the other one is that uh, we are also within uh, policy, public uh, institutions that require of results. 
and the way you are measuring your results is through uh, publications in academia, in academic journals, peer review and so on. And uh, this uh, takes time because if you do this type of uh, if you do this type of publications, which normally also they go with no names, that you are not uh, uh, providing the quality that you are going to be measured. So that means that you have to do double workload. You have double work a uh, lot. You have to work for your work. That means writing academic journals and you know and all this uh, stuff, which is the one for which you are uh, um, evaluated. But then you are engaged with the social movement, and you cannot say, "Okay, I have all this. Here you have it." So, okay, come on. <laughs> I cannot. You, I cannot read 1,000 pages document, but I cannot read either. You know this document in English and. Uh, you know, with academic, uh, academic uh, vocabulary. So that means that you have to engage as, as well in, uh, in the writing in different language, right? A language which is uh, more popular, let's say, no? So uh, you have double, uh, double, um, double workload. No? But uh, uh, in a way, it's also a form to be activist if you want to. This is a way because uh, you are also providing your time in uh, activism doesn't mean that you have to be all the time, you know, in all the demonstrations. Uh, it also means that you can be activist in a different way. And we could say probably this is another form of being activist with the movement. Try to put, uh, dedicate your time, put your time in uh, develop, in, in presenting the science, the academic uh, findings in a different, uh, with a different conceptualization, with a different form, right? Um, um, well, I have other things here but with examples on some, but if we want maybe to engage in a discussion or, uh, you know, because I'm talking too much. Uh, Comments, questions. Okay. Sharing experiences, sharing experiences of... Uh, we have two now, three, and then we will... Yes, yes. I have a very quick question. Um, what, how Can you introduce yourself also? Because everyone know me, and I'm not <laughs> expect, I don't expect to know all of you now. But at least are these people who are talking. Also. Yes, uh, I'm Stefania Barca, and um, I'm a, an environmental historian by by training, by profession. I also do political ecology, and I work uh, in Coimbra at the Center for Social Studies, uh, where you uh, where Guaventura Santos is based. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, so I like very much uh, the, the way you applied the idea of uh, the sociology of absence uh, to your case. I think it's very appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a very short question. How do you define present agriculture? Mm -hmm. Because I was struck by what you said, that 70%, if I'm correct, of the food production comes from peasant agriculture. I was convinced that it was the opposite. <laughs> so how, can you give me... Uh, you know, a, a definition, what is peasant agriculture? In the... Is it right if we take some of them? Ah, okay, probably we can take some of them. Uh, yeah, I think it's better, no? no? It's yeah, better yes, 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 yes. I don't know what time is it. Uh, ah, okay, so we are perfect. So another question, if, if okay, we can... If she doesn't remember the question, just leave it. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have three questions, but my name is Come on, Irma, uh, you know, <laughs> you're the only person I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on agriculture and I'm also working in, uh, in a corporate head and analysis in Turkey. So, <laughs> your presentation was very nice and uh, I, that's why I have started. You don't need to say all the time <laughs> this, eh? Uh... Uh, first, uh, first of all, how do you see the role and potential of cooperatives uh, in, and the networks of solidarity economy uh, in, the, in the movement of uh, food sovereignty in food movement? And how, is, how close they really can work? Yeah, because I wasn't going to forget. Now you are starting to have, a, and I think it's an interesting things. Yeah. Uh, and how close they can work with the uh, via compressing like two sides of the coin, let's say again, uh, production sides, production cooperatives, peasants, uh, small scale agriculture, and uh, consumption cooperatives, let's say. That's the first place question. Uh, the second one, uh, I'm just wondering uh, what, could you, what, what could you comment on the relation of La Via Campesina with fisher people? How is it really uh, close again? I mean, I know that they are part of it to some extent, but 
like the world forum of fisher peoples and so on, uh, small scale uh, small scale fishermen, fisher people, to what extent they are in the movement. The third one is about the participatory guarantee mechanisms, like uh, as mm. as a response to organic certification mechanism and uh, <coughs> as a response to the adoption um, to the adoption of it by capitalism. Uh, I guess it's came out also from Latin America. Uh, peasants created a network of participatory, uh, they first uh, called it participatory, participatory certification system, then they changed it uh, to a participatory guarantee mechanism as far as I know. So do you think, uh, would you comment uh, whether it's a good alternative or would you see it also like weak because it imitates uh, the organic like labeling which is within the capitalism? As you said, as you mentioned. Probably we can take one more and that's it because I. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I have a specific question. So, my name is Irina. I, um, I, I did research in, on anti mining movement in Romania, where I come from. Now I'm in Coimbra working with Stefania. Um, I have sort of like two question comments, perhaps more reflexive that we can talk about it, but just I want to put it out there because I'm curious if you have a reaction to it. So first, um, um, I really liked uh, the fact that you pointed out that uh, trust is very important in, in alliances and in building. I'm trying to write about trust and ethics in movement, mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious how, how do you think about this issue? Because, I mean, just writing about ethics, like you said, you know, in the production of knowledge, Admitting that you have an, uh, not just a, uh, an ethical, like methodological kind of uh, accuracy, but you have a political position as well, is very controversial, no? So how do how do you think about trust and ethics in this kind of um, production of knowledge in science through movement? <laughs> and the second question, I want to challenge a little bit because I really like the fact that. You okay, we don't want to use instruments that are produced by the system. But I want to ask you, whenever we, uh, we demand for rights, the discourse of rights is not still a pro tra product of modernist states. How do we get out of it? Because for me, it's still a deadlock. And from what I've seen from the movement, it's still not enough in that sense. Interesting. Um, I will give the answer I can give uh, because I and uh, you know you know uh, as I give you my but um, I think all of, of all your questions are very very interesting. Some are more reflexive, as you say, others are more practical. So the peasant definition. The peasant definition is broad definition, even for the Via Campesina, right? So that means, uh, for instance, it's not only those who produce through. Uh, in agriculture, so that means you, you have the pastoralists, you have the fishermen, and you have um, uh, indigenous people, they included like uh, peasant, that uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, indigenous people and uh, um, collectors, so people in the forest that collect the food for self-consumption. Self All this is included in the concept of peasant that La Via Campesina has. Okay? So they are like the movement for food sovereignty and they, way, they say uh, we, are produce, we are the people who produce the food worldwide. They are including all of this. But although most of them are people who produce food through agriculture, right? Which is the majority of, uh, of all this uh, movement, right? To me, uh, but this is an issue of discussion. Peasant is the, and then this is going probably to just to charge enough uh, studies, no? Um, one of the main characteristics is that your objective is the reproduction of the system, right? So um, <coughs> you want to produce, but you want your system to be sustainable enough as to be reproduced as well. Because, for instance, in, our, in aquaculture, you have six years of overextraction, and five, six years, the system is finished. You cannot, uh, you cannot define yourself as peasant and because your main objective is the accumulation of capital. So it's capitalist uh, agriculture. Peace and agriculture, main objective is the reproduction of the system of course, to be able to earn a life, you know, to, earn, to make a life and to have a livelihood from this, 
but to be able to reproduce the system. And this, uh, this, um, this uh, number that was given by uh, the ETC, the, um, what's the, 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 the siglas of ETC? Uh, see, see, um, but you know, you just uh, do the search and, uh, and I can also provide you the... the so that means that uh, you can include in that way peasant farmers here. Uh, I didn't understand who gave this number? ETC, ETC, ETC group. ETC group dot o r g. Okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, yeah. What, what is it? What do they do? They, they yeah. came from from uh, basically biotechnology issues in relation with with farming, and then they have evolved, and now it's 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 broader like a broader approach to many these all yes. sorts of food related technology issues. And so it's they're um, like a reference for many. And they do research which is not academic in a way. You know, there are also NGOs who do research like grain, like ETC and others, like FIAM, for instance, that uh, in facility. And they are not academic, but they do also, the Transnational uh, Institute, they also do research, you know, they are not academic, they're linked, but. Uh. So um, I think in the, this, this definition, which is actually an old definition, mm -hmm. allow you also to put in the, in the equation farmers from the north who are. Family farmers, yes. So they are capital letters of erosion, technology, and concentration. It is. Mm -hmm. So you know that too, you know? <laughs> For me, it is group, you know, it happens. So this is how I will define it. This is how I will define it. Probably is not how, this is why I'm going to refer you to this, uh, to this uh, um, paper, because they are the one ha who gave that number. And I think it's important that uh, you have a look. Right? Because now I don't remember exactly the paper. The paper was 2011, I think it was, this paper. And uh, I think it's important for you to, to have a look at it. And if you want, we can also, also discuss uh, later on, because you will have my, my email address, okay? Yeah, just one clarification. So you mean, so wage laborers who work mm -hmm. for capitalist agriculture are peasant agriculture part or not? They're not, right? They are part of la Villa Campesina. But they, not, they, they are not farmers. It's, they it's are not, but it's exactly. confusing. They are workers, they are not farmers. Yeah. So they but for la Villa Campesina, they are I don't they think. On, on yeah, the but I don't think for this study. I don't think they use it for this study, eh? because this, camp, this food is produced from industrial farming and comes from capital uh, agriculture, industrial capitalized agriculture, right? Although that doesn't mean that these people, as workers, they defend a different food system, they defend their rights, and they are part of La Via Campesina. And here in Spain, we have the SOC movement, which is a, um, a Sindicato de Obreros del Campo. So, this in, uh, you understand in Portuguese, no? Sindicato de Obreros del Campo. They are jornaleros, so the work movement, and they are part of La Via Campesina. But for this specific uh, case, you are, uh, you are asking me. I don't think this, uh, the work from these people was part of the number, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the food which is produced from these exactly. people that, that comes from industrial question. system, exactly. okay? okay. Uh, the cooperatives of peasants. <laughs> cooperatives, uh, we actually mm -hmm. had this, this thing I, I show you here. This is a, a magazine that you can find in the internet, and it's a magazine which is called Food Sovereignty, uh, Biodiversity and Cultures. Um, <laughs> And we have created here in Spain with uh, people from university, people from uh, La Via Campesina in Spain, uh, people from NGOs, people that de defend the food sovereignty. And uh, actually we had, and we discussed topics, specific topics uh, as uh, related to food sovereignty and we want to problematize. So we problematize about these topics. One of the topics we problematized was about cooperatives. And this is the typical uh, example of what I was saying before cooptation by the system, no? You have to be, at least in the north uh, part of the, the global north, uh, <laughs> the, a lot of care with it because um, nowadays cooperatives of farmers are like uh, capital, capitalist enterprise. So from a food perspective, the only way that cooperatives can provide an alternative is when they are inserted within the social uh, solidarity economy. Economia uh, Social Solidaria, social, social and Solidarity Economy, which have different premises to capitalist economy, of course. So, um, 
But when you are a cooperative, that your main aim is to earn money uh, and you have no other criteria and to increase your uh, rate of return from what you are producing, then you are a capitalist cooperative and this is not uh, part of the food sovereignty debate. Okay? It's part of the problem actually. Because what they have been doing in the case of food is um, demobilizing farmers. For instance, what? Yeah, Mondragon. Consume Mondragon. Mondragon group was for many years the main, uh, let's say, example in industrial terms of how a cooperative could be built in, in a regional area mm -hmm. with many different uh, branches or aspects. And, and now it has been shown to be a, uh, a more or less the same status of think that basically all the rest of the structures. Yeah. So unless you don't change the framework and, and from which you are working from, that means that you are not uh, an alternative. This is the case at least of cooperatives. Eh? My, my over 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 <coughs> thoughts on it. No? The relation of Lavia Campesina with Fisher, um, as far as I know, probably uh, <coughs> no, there is not like this. There are two global movements of fisheries. And one has a lot of good relations, and the other one not so good. Um, but uh, when they <coughs> talk about uh, food sovereignty in La Via Campesina and so on, they always include the small scale fishermen, fisher people. Okay? So, so I will say, in term, general terms, relation is good. Um, there is, uh, in, when we talk about this issue of the alliance, alliances, the food sovereignty created a uh, um, uh, figure, which is the IPC, the International uh, Committee for uh, Food Sovereignty. Can you say the IPC? Sometimes it's the problem of acronyms, eh? that you know at the beginning, but then you use it so much that you forget more or less what they, was the origin. <laughs> but um, and the IPC basically was a kind of um, networking of different organizations working for, uh, from, um, from a food sovereignty perspective and fighting for food sovereignty. You know, uh, women's, uh, women's uh, groups, uh, fishermen, pastoralists, indigenous groups and so on. And it was a kind of, um, uh, this, this group uh, uh, which has a different, which has a structure and you know, so by regions and by topics, um, they had a direct uh, dialogue with FAO. It was an instrument for dialogue with the uh, FAO, right? International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, right? And um, the IPC, uh, they also had the, the, the Fisher, uh, uh, the movement of Fisher, it was the uh, international movement for Fisher, it was, uh, it was within the IPCC and with very good relations with La Via Campesina. So. <coughs> um, the participatory warranty, uh, participatory warranty mechanism potential for me is high. Because it really has been built from below, one thing. But second, because the premises to, to access to a certification thing, let's say, is completely different to, to the premises of a normal certification, right? So your objective is, um, pro first, the principles are discussed between all the actors. What do you want? And the, what you have here completely, is completely different to what you have 20 kilometers away. So then you have not one standardization system, uh, static, which is uh, valid uh, for all, you know, for a, a whole country or a whole region or the whole world, like, uh, you know, the flow system of uh, fair trade. But it means that you have, a, um, you know, a perm some premises that a group of people agree. They can be revised any time. If people new enter into the group, they can say, I don't agree with this. I would like to revise these principles. It's completely different. So I would say for me it's more based on that dialogue of the saberes mm -hmm. than it is based on the principles of uh, capitalist uh, certification, right? So it's based on no, hi no hierarchies, uh, look for the common good and uh, things, uh, things like this. Um, the truth and ethics in the production of knowledge with movement, no? <coughs> Then the question was, uh, because we are long, what is for me the importance of truth? So what is the potentiality? Yeah, trust. You were talking about trust. Trust. And well, trust, trust. Yes. We can develop a little bit. <coughs> yeah. Um, Maybe with a story or something. With a story? What makes you think that it's trust and ethics? 
So I want to first do the rights because I think the trust is going to be a bit, more, a bit longer. <laughs> uh, the rights thing, I totally agree with you, actually. And there's a lot of debate. Even for the, because uh, the, the full Soviet uh, proposal was developed with a rights uh, base, <coughs> no? And actually they still uh, build uh, the right of uh, peasants, no? Like the new letter for the rights of peasants and they developed the, the proposal from the, you know, as a, as a policy, as a political proposal to achieve the right to food and so on, no? And here there is a lot of discussion. Here, for instance, we have this example, at least in the Via Campesina debate, of an utilitarian strategy, as I said. Okay. We know in our society the discourse on rights is potent, no? it's uh, strong, and we are going to use it. <coughs> and mostly, actually, uh, that they include even the, the, because we have the, um, the community rights, but they, normally when people talk about <coughs> rights, they talk about individual rights. <coughs> no? So it's, uh, you know, when you look, when you think, in the general thinking of people, when you think about rights, you are thinking about the individual rights, which goes, and it is normal because they were developed in the context of capitalism, you know, where individualism is very important, you know, and actually you have here in most countries the private property, which is an individual right, is over uh, common, common rights, right, that uh, are also accepted by the United Nations, no? So individual rights is uh, like, you know, and uh, so there is a contradiction here, but to my knowledge, uh, probably I am not, uh, probably it's, it's what I think and probably it's not right, eh? but to my knowledge, uh, this is a contradiction which is known. You know what I mean? It's not a contradiction to say, so it's a kind of this utilitarian use of rights in order to achieve what you want to, what you want to achieve. Whether this is a good or a strategy or not, this is another matter of discussion, because then we are talking about what I was saying before, that if we are using you know, the tools developed by the system, I'm not so sure that we can really change the system. No? And then you always have uh, the, the, the risk that you fall down into, this, uh, into the middle way and you achieve your final objective. But uh, specifically this issue, I think, is a um, is, uh, noun it's a noun and a <coughs> contradiction, right? And about the issue of trust, uh, trust uh, and ethics, uh, how I do I get, how I did get to, to here, no? It was from my own experience. Mm. And actually I leave it like this myself, no? When, as I have said, no, we are developing this agroecology uh, chair, and the, ¿cómo se dice decano? Dean. Dean, no, the dean, no, the vicerrector. Vice-rector. Vice-rector of our university, he doesn't know anything about sovereignty, but I talk quite a lot about with him. He like it. He doesn't know what it is, but he like it, no? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's very active and so on and so And uh, so we are trying to develop this master of alternative agri food systems and so And why don't you talk with these people? So his name is Jordi. Okay, Jordi. We are not so many people working on Fusumidi. We know who we are. So I don't say these people are not uh, good. I know probably they are very good, uh, you know, uh, researchers and very good people and so on. I cannot introduce these people in the, you know, in the process. It's impossible because um, this can put the process in peril. The process as we are going to develop it is uh, from bottom up thing, no? You can develop a master, for instance. I'm kind of trying to explain with a, with a practical base. Right? We are going to develop this master, and this master, uh, for me, is very easy, you know, you have the theoretical knowledge, which are the important things from an academia point of view, and, uh, you know, academic point of view, which uh, have to be in an alternative agri-food uh, systems uh, uh, master, put it a draft to, you know, to the university and just, you just pass the process and so on. If you want to do it well in this kind of uh, things, you have to go to the movements, to the people below. Not only movement, but people who is doing agroecology and who is doing in the practice uh, creating alternative agri food movements and present the proposal to see what they think, what do you think, do you think there is something missing and so on. This is not something you do in one year, this is something that requires more time, no? <coughs> and now imagine we are doing this 
and you put in the middle, and this is not even trust in the, among, between you and the movement, it's trust within the academia in that issue as uh, fragile as, um, you know, in an issue like this, no? For somebody, I cannot do that. I mean, even if they are very nice, even if they are, you know, people who are critics, eh? which I don't know because I've never heard about them. Mm, it's not possible <laughs> because it can something like this. It can already uh, uh, break the process, right? And uh, with the moving, it's exactly the same. You know, it's a very because it's a very anti-capitalist um, and very political um, uh, spirit. Which, uh, of course, this is my personal experience, no? But um, so it requires long-term, face-to-face interaction in everyday life. This yes. is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, perfect. You could do it. Uh, you could say it from here. <laughs> <laughs> It's exactly, I mean, I've been engaged in the social movement for Fusumiti since 2005, 2004, more or less. And, uh, and actually it's because of the fall of them that I've been a, how do you say, precarious person almost all my life until last year. <laughs> because uh, in the past I was, you know, natural scientist and so on, you know, and you have a lot of money and very easy to get, uh, you do this. <laughs> <laughs> It was a pattern, it's a kind of, you know, uh, that you decide. Uh, and these things uh, you talk to with the people and they see you are here, you are there, and you ask for nothing. This is something very important as well. This is, uh, this is I didn't mention, I think it's very important. And it's also a very typical mistake of NGOs, also from a, of academics. Um, they have money, they give it to La Via Campesina to do, I have this money and we can do this with these people and this, uh, I say, okay, no. if you want to help, you can give us the money, and then we decide it, how we use it, probably in this topic, because it has been given by, to, to be used by that topic. But if you have, if you put at the premises of how and to who, for what and to who we have to call and in which way we have to use it, then it's a kind of, uh, Okay, it's something we have to build collectively. It's not something that has to be imposed, right? It's not the way of working with them, right? Which doesn't mean that you don't have your, uh, this, is, this is dialogue with Saberes, everyone has a talk, has a, has a say, right? It doesn't mean that you cannot say your say as well, okay? But, uh, and after years uh, working with them without really asking, you know, I don't know, be famous or, you know, whatever, you can say, I don't know. Then people also trust what you are doing no? because they know you are doing because you believe on this. It's very easy to see when people is uh, doing something that they believe on this, or they just doing because uh, accidentally they fall there, and which is nothing wrong on that, uh, with that. Eh? It's only that I think in this topic specifically, uh, trust is very important because give you this plus I have told you before, but you cannot have it, and you can work from a theoretical perspective, you can be a critical researcher, you can be many things which are very valid, very important, and very necessary. We are talking and talking with the social, working uh, codo con codo, you know, face to face with the social movement. Where trust is very important. It's my time. I think we are running out of time. <coughs> the topic of information that you have asked, the report, it was called uh, Who We Feed Us. And it was produced in 2009, now I remember. It takes a little bit of time. Now, it, and there was a second version in 2012, which is the one that you mentioned. Uh, the way of, of, of getting the information, it was, on one hand, uh, they do like a stakeholder meetings on this sort of approach. And also, they, I remember that they have an information another way around, which was, uh, they looked to the records of how, which part of the food is produced without uh, chemical industry inputs. <coughs> this is something very important for them in terms of marketing. So there were quite good studies on how much food is still produced without our reporter. And then they, this number, this figure was around 40% of the food is produced without chemical production. So they say, okay, then it's quite safe to say 60% is produced in this, let's say, organic way. But this is a, a, a figure which is, in fact, a lower level. Much of the production, which is linked with the upper Campesina, is produced also with some sort of chemicals. Yes. So it's clearly like a very low, low estimation. So it, it will be higher. At least it's, <coughs> it's an estimation. So 
Thanks, uh, Marta. I, I, I think we have to close now, but <coughs> so you have any sort of doubts? Please, you can write me or whatever. Okay. Thanks.